the 103rd Psalm tonight. <coughs> Psalm 103. How many of you know that the uh, 119th Psalm is the acrostic Psalm? Every letter of the Hebrew alphabet precedes the verse in the uh, 119th Psalm. It's quite a remarkable thing when you get on down through there. Then you have the Song of Degrees. What is that? That's under the reign of Hezekiah the king, that they had ascent to the top of the mountain of God, to Moriah, and every portion of that ascent was measured in degrees. And so when you take these songs of degrees and compare them with your ascent to God, they teach a great lesson. The 103rd Psalm says it's a Psalm of David. And uh, it's uh, the, uh, uh, some said it's the Magna Carta of the great blessing of Almighty God uh, as the soul rejoices and praises God for His goodness. Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known His ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will He keep His anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward them that, f that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are but dust. Father, I pray now, Lord, that you'd anoint the messenger. As I attempt to give forth your word tonight, bless it, and bless it to the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This is a wonderful psalm. This is the kind of psalm that you need to read in your own uh, time of privacy and meditate practically on every word that you read because it is a declaration of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the declaration of His character. And this is what you need to understand about God, His character. Now, I'm sure you've met people who let you down. I'm sure you had, your, I'm sure you had confidence in someone and trusted them and somewhere they failed you. And when that happened... It was grief to your soul, and this happens. This is human. This is the human experience. For when you do put your trust in man, you're putting your trust in a very shaky foundation, believe me. Now, some men, no doubt, are better than other men, and some men have sterling character. And at best, though, they are still men. And the best of men are, at best, still men. So you've got to keep that in mind. But if you put your trust in God, you're trusting in His character, you're trusting in who He is. You're trusting in how He relates to you. You're trusting in His proven track record. This is what we'll deal with tonight. His proven track record of thousands of years of dealing with humanity. So the 103rd Psalm has some great truths. We can learn from it. We don't have time to go through every single bit of it. But we'll spend some time with portions of it tonight. The writer of Psalm, David, says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. The Hebrew word bless is barak. Barak. That's what the Hebrew, that's what the Hebrew word is. Now, in Hebrew, you can have different forms of verb. And that different forms of the verb applies to the Hebrew word. And it changes its meaning slightly. But the basic word is barak. Sometimes it can be translated one way, another way. For example, one way it can be translated bless. Another way it can be translated kneel, and so forth. So it's a good study when you get into tracing the etymology of these words. 
And I would recommend a book for you. It's called A Theological Word, Book of the Old Testament. You'd be surprised at how much you can learn from a book like that that will take the word Barak and it'll show you how it's used in the Bible in the different verb forms. And the verb forms are quite different than they are in English. But if you notice in verse number 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul. You're blessing God because God has blessed you. You can only return to the Lord what the Lord has given you. For someone to say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, that has never been blessed of God, is vanity. And it's an empty statement with no meaning whatsoever. As a matter of fact, it's mockery to the real believer who does bless God and blesses Him greatly because of God's blessing upon him. So the, so the writer, David, says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. In Second Chronicles chapter number 6, verses 12 through 36, we read these words. He stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands. For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long, and five cubits broad, and three cubits high, and had set it in the midst of the court, and upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees. The word translated kneeled here is barak. Now I want you to notice the context and see if you can get the nuance of the meaning, of the meaning of the word. It's the same word that is translated blessed in Psalm 103, verse number 1. But it reveals a little more about what it is to be blessed. Notice carefully, when he kneeled down, he was showing in the presence of all of the people in Israel, his subjects, even though he is the king, he's kneeling down to one greater than him. The king is bowing to the king. You see what I mean? And he's bowing to the king. He's manifesting real humility. Humility is a prized possession. Solomon, when he started his reign, it's one of the saddest cases in all the Bible. For when Solomon started, he started right. He sought the wisdom of God. He worshipped God and offered himself truly to the Lord and sought his face. The word Barak is translated kneeled because Solomon knew he had been blessed. He had been blessed greatly. So he was returning that unto his father. Are you following me tonight? If you have been truly blessed and you have a spirit of uh, humility about you, you understand what the blessings of God are about, it will bring you to your knees. It will humble you. And then you will begin to learn the true meaning of blessed. Because the true meaning of blessed has to do with your attitude toward God. When you take into your soul and try to begin to receive who He is, in his character, there is none greater, there is none more just, there is none more righteous, there is none that exists apart from him. God said to Isaiah, I am the Lord, beside me there is none other. He is the blesser, and he has blessed me greatly. So in Psalm 103, when we read it over here in Second Chronicles chapter number 6, same word, we see that Solomon is bowing before the children. Now this is not grandstanding. And you know, you get a lot of this. You politicians are horrible to grand. I get so sick of it. You know, they're, they're rising to the top and they, they use the occasion to make a statement about something. They don't have any heart in it, but they're using it, you see. So what you have here, though, is a king who truly loves God. And he's bowing before God with his people behind him. And his people are acknowledging the fact, my king loves the Lord. And so my king is bowing to the king. It's almost as if Solomon knew all the way back then that the Lord God Jehovah was the king of kings. <laughs> and the Lord of lords. And he is the king of kings. And the Lord of lords, folks. He is king of kings. And he is Lord of lords. So he bowed. The Bible says, Before all the congregation of Israel spread forth his hands toward heaven and said, O Jehovah, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keepest covenant and showest mercy to thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Thou which hast kept with thy servant David my father, that which thou hast promised him, and hast spakest with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is this day. Solomon is thanking God for being faithful 
to the promise that he made to his father David and being faithful to Israel. For he is the God of Israel. Now you've got to remember the context of the Old Testament. The children of Israel were for the most part mostly outnumbered when it came to their foes. And as far as all their foes were concerned, they were completely outnumbered. And so it was a match between the God of Israel and the God of all the rest of the gods out here, the pagan gods. And so one God was matched against the other God. It was a matter of whether the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was the true and living God. Are you following me? Because if all the gods surrounding Israel were able to destroy Israel, that would show that their God was weak. I mean, well, who wants to serve a God that can't even protect you and keep you and so forth? But God said, if you will obey me and serve me and do that which I have commanded to you, I will take care of you. In other words, I'll feed you, I'll protect you, I'll bring none of these diseases upon you that I brought upon the Egyptians. You're my people, and I will show the heathen that there is a God in Israel. That's what it means. It means the same thing today. The heathen, pagan, fake Christians, and fake churches need to know that there is a real, true, and living God. And I'm going to put this here, what I'm talking to you about this tonight. I firmly believe that we are coming to the very end. I believe it's soon. And the reason I do is because there's too many things that are happening. Too much, too much, too quickly. And this is the time when you're going to make your decision about whether you're going to accept the truth and separate yourself from the apostasy of these churches about you, or you're just going to flow, go with the flow, and you know, and not offer any resistance. In other words, if you are truly born of the Spirit of God, there's going to be something inside you that says, separate yourself from these people. These are apostates. They're not real Christians. Don't be counted with them. Leave them. Come out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord. And that is God building and protecting His church. And I believe that's happening. Second Samuel chapter number 6 and verse number 20. Then David returned to bless his household. Now watch this. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, Now listen to this sarcasm in her voice. How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Jehovah, before the Lord, he said, which chose me before thy father and before all his house. Let's put a little explanation in here now. Get the historical context of what's happening. The Ark of the Covenant had been taken. It was taken by the Philistines. You remember the two that had died, the sons of Eli. And a child was born, and his name was Ichabod. The glory hath departed. It stayed with the Philistines, but they couldn't handle it. It came back to the land, Beth Shemesh. They, when it was brought back, they looked into the ark. Thousands, ten thousands of them died. People at that moment began to understand the ark of the covenant of God is a holy vessel. Not made for public consumption. Only through the right way could it be approached. And so, it went from one place to the next place. Uzzah touched it. Uzzah died. And eventually it went to the house of Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom. His name means a servant of Edom. He was an outsider. He was a pagan. But he had asked to join. He wanted to be part of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He came in and had no idea the blessing that awaited him. He had no idea. His choice brought him into the place of blessing. And so Obed Edom, the Ark of the Covenant, was brought to his house. It stayed there and they observed how that God blessed Obed Edom. He killed Uzzah, but he blessed Obed-Edom. Same ark, different circumstances. Now they remove the ark from the house of Obed-Edom. And they're going to take it up to Ophel, or the city of David. And there they pitched a tent for it. A temporary tent where they can put this ark until they can build a permanent structure, a temple to house it in. Before it had been in a tabernacle, all of its ex from the time it was made. By Bezalel, it had stayed in that tabernacle. But now it has been brought the house of Obed-Edom. It's been brought out. And David, true to his nature, goes to where the ark is. And there's a procession where the ark is leading, leaving the house of Obed-Edom. And it is headed to Jerusalem. 
He comes before that ark and he turns around and he begins to lead it and he dances before God. He rejoices and jumps up and down and shouts and praises God. Now think about Solomon when he got down on his knees and he lifted his hands toward heaven and he acknowledged the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as his God and his king. Well now here David the king, the king of Israel, David, is dancing and rejoicing and praising God before the king and before, before the ark of the covenant. He's saying this ark is very important. But Michael was the youngest daughter of Saul. A little historical context. Michael was eventually given to David as his wife. So Saul tried to have David killed. He thought he could have him put to death when he went out and had the hundred foreskins of Philistines. David brought back 200. This woman became his wife, Michael. And when she became his wife, she loved him. She protected David. She hid him one night. She took care of him. And David was able to escape because of Saul's youngest daughter, because Saul was a demon-possessed king of Israel. And so God used her. She protected and loved David. But after they were separated, a period of 14 years passed. And during that period of time, Michael had another husband. She had another husband. She'd been separated from David. She fell in love with her other husband. But when David came in as the king, and David came in with authority and power... He said, I want my wife back. I want my wife back. And so they went and they took her, and they took her away from her husband, who loved her greatly. One of the saddest scenes in all the Bible is where they are taking Michael by force and removing her from her husband, and her husband is following behind, weeping and crying. He wants his wife back. That began to move something in the heart of Michael toward her former husband, David. Then she finds David has added two wives to his harem since she was gone. He's got two. He didn't stop with two. He had more than two. <laughs> Solomon learned a lot about wives from his daddy, David. But anyway, he had added these two wives to his harem. She finds out about this realizes what he's doing to take her away from a man that loves her, and knowing that all he's going to do is just add her to his harem. And so the Bible says in Second Samuel chapter number 6 and verse number 16, As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord. Now listen to this. And she despised him in her heart. She hated him. So at one time, the man that she loved with all of her heart, now she despises with all of her heart. Her love for David was wonderful and great, and her hatred for David was real and deep. She despised him. And so when David is dancing before the Ark of the Covenant, this woman looks out the window and looks down at her former husband, and she has nothing but vitriolic, acid criticism to heap upon him. And here she heaps it upon him. Now let's read the context and you're going to see what happens. The Bible says in Second Samuel chapter number 6 and verse number 20, David returned to bless his household. Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. Now look how David answers her. And David said unto Michael, It was before Jehovah that I'm dancing, which chose me before thy father Saul, that's who her father was, and before all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before Jehovah. I will play before the Lord. He rebuked her to her face. She hated him, and David turned it back on her and said, Let me tell you something, lady. God chose me over your daddy, remember? And God chose me over your daddy, and I am going to rejoice, and I'm going to dance before this ark. Now watch this. Verse 22. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be based in mine own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. 
And I think the reference here to maid servants may very well be a reference to his wives that he had at the time. But look what verse 23 says, 2 Samuel chapter number 6. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. Well, what happened here, preacher? She tried to curse David. You curse David and you'll be cursed. It'll come back on your own head. If she had blessed David, she would have been blessed. But she tried to curse him. And you can't curse him. There are people out here every day, walk the streets, go to jobs, and it's cursing God and the Lord Jesus Christ every breath out of their body. Some of them don't even realize how addicted they are to cursing and blaspheming. If you don't hear it all the time, and every, and every, and every once in a while, for some reason, you get plugged in somewhere and, and for, until you can get away from it, you hear all this stuff, you're a marvel at how much of this is coming out of the mouths of some people. Do you know why cursing and bitterness comes out of your mouth? It's because your heart's cursed. You're cursed. You're cursed. You're cursed. Don't tell me you go to church and you sing in the choir and that you're a Christian. If all you can do is curse and blaspheme God, you're cursed. And so, Michael, I understand. I can, I can sympathize with her. I can. With the fact that her husband was taken from her because he loved her. And she knew he did. And he followed along behind, but, the, but one of the generals stopped him and said, Far enough, you can't go any further. And she knew that. And she hated David in her heart. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Amen. Bless His name. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 33, verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. <laughs> Paul, I know. And Jesus I know, but who are you? <laughs> these seven sons of Sceva that were, that were exorcists, they were going to cast these demons out of people in the book of Acts. And the devils knew who Paul was, and they knew who Jesus was, they knew who Peter was, no doubt about it. But who are you? I'm glad, thank God, they know who I am in hell. <laughs> I am. But I'm going to tell you why, because I know who they are. If Listen, if a brush rises up in the air and flies through a room in my house, or some little child says to me, uh, Dad, Mom, Granddaddy, Granddad, whatever, who are these people over there in that other room? And you begin to see all this so-called supernatural activity take place in your house, remember this. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Get on your knees and bless the God of heaven. And in the name of Jesus, command them to leave your house. Confront them face on. For they are spirit beings. But if you are born again, you've got the Holy Ghost in you. Confront them. And you'll see them leave. They have to leave. You know why they have to leave? Most, 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 most people have a kind of a surface understanding and a kind of a, 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 a simple, simplistic understanding of the atonement. And the power of the blood of Christ. They really do. They don't really understand how much power is in the name of Christ and in the blood of Christ. They don't. But the spirit world does. They do. And if you confront them in the name of Christ and plead the blood of Christ against them, they will honor and acknowledge the one that is vastly superior to them. They have to. They have no choice no matter. So he said, I know thee by name. In Exodus 33, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God is a merciful God. Mercy got me into this church. Mercy led me down the aisle. Mercy is the one who opened the scripture up and showed me how to be saved. And mercy is the one who took that prayer and offered it to the Father through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we didn't have mercy, we wouldn't make it five seconds tonight. So I've been serving the Lord for a hundred years, preacher, making a difference. Without the mercy of God, we wouldn't make it. We need mercy. Hallelujah to God for mercy. 
David said in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord of my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. I mentioned this morning about a lady who, who wrote a letter talking about how that she had been in the abortion business at one time personally involved in the death of many children, babies, and had a struggle being forgiven for what she'd done. She was saved, no question about that, born again. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, many times have I told you that repentance is a work of the Holy Spirit that begins when you're born again and continues throughout the rest of your life. You're not saved because you repent. You're saved because you believe. But if you believe, you're going to repent. <laughs> you can't separate them. They're inseparable. All right. She said that people used to walk up and down in front of the abortion clinic and scream at them and tell them how ungodly they were because they were in there uh, performing abortions. The people would walk up and down outside the clinic, carry their placards and all of that, and scream at them and yell at them. And she said that by watching them, that she thought to, within herself, if their God is like that, I don't want any part of their God. And so she observed this. But then she said something strange happened. Some of those very people who walked up and down in front of her abortion clinic on occasion would come into the clinic with one of their own daughters or granddaughters to have an abortion. Digest that. When she confronted them about it and said, well, you were the one out here, you were marching before us here, you're screaming at us, and now you're in here, and they'll say, well, it's a different set of circumstances. It's different for us. Well, it's not any different. Human life is human life. And I have no truck with baby killers. Got no use for them. But you see, that right there is one of the big issues of why so many people today in this country are going to hell. They're watching fake Christians go to fake churches with fake professions of faith who preach to them and then turn right around and live exactly the way they do. There's nothing, I don't know of anything worse than that. That's pure hypocrisy. All right? That's, the, that's what's going on. These people don't know anything about forgiveness. If you've ever been forgiven for something that really wore you down and ate you up, you're ready to forgive that other one. You're ready to forgive them for what they've done. You can do it. You can forgive them. If you can't forgive them, it'll eat at you like a cancer. And nothing will consume your soul worse than not being able to forgive. The first one that needs to be forgiven is you. I need to be forgiven. The Lord only knows how I can understand how some poor blind dog can be brought up out of the sewer and can be brought to the light and can be born again. I can understand that because I am that old dog that was brought up out of the sewer and the light came and God saved my soul. Amen. And this brings us to where the scripture says, when Abraham came before the Lord, Genesis chapter 18, verse 27, Abraham, and said, Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Now, he's not, he's not grandstanding. You know, he's not flattering God. He's not, Abraham is not saying what he thinks God wants to hear. How many of you have ever prayed that way? Everybody raise your hand, huh? You learn a good old pretty religious prayer. I mean, you can, oh, you can pray some beautiful prayers. You ought to listen to me pray. I mean, I can do some praying. Some people get that idea. And when actually some of the best praying you've ever done, your mouth did not open. <laughs> it was all for the meditation of the heart. But anyway, he said, I am but dust and ashes. Abraham was one of the richest men in the world when he said that. Do you realize that? Do you realize that Abraham and Lot had so much wealth that they had to separate? That the land couldn't take care of them? 
And the Bible said, Lot lifted up his eyes and he beheld Sodom. The plains were well watered every for, everywhere as the garden of the Lord. So Lot had pitched his tent towards Sodom. And once Lot had pitched his tent towards Sodom, God said, Abraham, Abraham, now lift up your eyes. Lot's made his choice. Now lift up your eyes, Abraham. God said, Lot chose what he has. I'm going to choose what you have. Lot made his choice based on temporal success. I'm going to give to you what divine blessing will give. And God said, raise your eyes, Abraham. And boy, when he did, God gave him the land as far as he could see it. He blessed him. He was rich like Job. He was rich beyond measure. And yet when he came before God to plead for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham knew he had stepped in to a spiritual world. He knew he was in the world of a priest. He knew he had stepped above land ownership. He, would, he had stepped higher than a billionaire. He knew now that he had stepped up on a spiritual plane with God. And he knew he was pleading for the souls of men. Are you following me tonight? If you're interested in spiritual things, leave your money there. And approach God, not on your money, but approach Him on your heart and the genuineness of your soul. Do you really care for men? And Abraham did. He did. He, was, he did. I am con firmly convinced in my mind and my heart that Abraham was as real and genuine and pure in his desire to see, to see the people in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah saved, his nephew Lot, Absolutely. But he knew when he approached that Holy One. And it always happens. He said, I'm just dust, Lord. <laughs> I probably bit off more than I can chew. I'm just dust. Dust. I may own half the country around here, but I'm just dust. Dust and ashes. I wish we could get that back in the church. I really do. There are churches in this town that if you've got a pile of money, they run you to the top real fast. Amen. Because they think money mean, makes a difference. They really do. They think it matters. You know, let me tell you what matters is the Lord God Almighty. God's what matters, not money. A widow gave a mite and she gave more than all the rest of them. What she gave? She gave her life. That's what she did. She gave her life to God. She gave everything she had to the Lord. That's why you don't hear a lot in here about money. God takes care of the money part. Oh, you give and He'll bless you. And He'll bless you be, and before you ever give. You give because He has blessed you. You learn that truth. You learn it. You learn that you cannot outgive the giver. You cannot outbless the blesser. You'll learn that truth. It may take some of you a long time. It may take some of you struggling to pay your bills. Keep a job, this, that, so forth, and so on, until you learn the simple truth. God is the one that pays your bills, not money. God puts food on your table, not money. God keeps you healthy, not money. God takes care of us, not money. And men, the Bible teaches, they have a love for filthy lucre, and the Bible said the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's a problem. Some folks can handle it, and some most can't. <laughs> Most can't. Some can. But Abraham said, I'm dust and ashes. Isaiah chapter 26, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. <laughs> now, do you, get, do you really get a hold of the picture here? Our hope is lost. Israel is a nation. We're dead. Our bones are dry. This is the valley of dry bones. This is Ezekiel looking at all these bones. And God says, can they live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, thou knowest. And yet, he said, they are in the dust. They've been reduced. All their glory, all their power, all their ability, all their braggadocio, all the kingdoms they've built, all the buildings they've built, all their science and technology, it's all winds up in the dust. And yet, he said, I'm going to bring them up and they're going to sing. There's a huge graveyard behind us. This town's full of graveyards. You travel, you travel across this country, graveyards everywhere, all over the place. These graveyards represent the lives of people living. There's nobody buried out there. There's no souls in that graveyard. Forget that garbage. 
but you have bodies out there with markers on them to say this this person lived. This is somebody that lived and walked this earth at one time. Long since forgotten. So many that are forgotten. The, pa the, the family has died out since then. And no record here or record. They're just long since forgotten. Yet God says the day's going to come when you rise and you sing. There's only one that can do that. You're going to you're not just rise and shake off the dust. And be alive again. He said you're going to rise and you're going to sing. I want to hear that choir. <laughs> Man, you talk about a song. I want to hear that. I want to hear it when they come up from the ground and they sing. You know who they're singing to? They're singing to the Lord God Jehovah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. They're going to rise and they're going to sing. The Bible said the hour is coming when all in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and come forth. They'll hear His voice and they'll come forth. As He spoke to, as he spoke to uh, Lazarus to come forth, they will come forth. Why? Because He has the power to raise the dead. If you've ever experienced a new birth, and some of you, I hope all of you have, some of you probably haven't, most of the religious people in this town haven't. But once you do, you will marvel at times. It's just going to blow your mind at how you've been changed. There's something inside you that wasn't in there before. And you don't have to make people understand it. When you meet a brother or a sister that has been born of the Spirit of God, they'll just say, I know what you mean. I know. I understand. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been there. I know what that is. You start talking to a religious person, though. Oh, I know. I believe in God, too. You know, I go to church, and I tithe, and I, you know, I appreciate that, and that's good for you, and all, and every, and what they're doing is crawfishing. They're throwing up walls. They're throwing up, up excuses. They can't handle it. And the reason they can't handle it is because they have never been born of the Spirit of God. And I would beg you tonight in the name of Jesus... If you have any bit in your soul, any desire in you whatsoever to know the God that I'm talking about, you ought to come down here and get on your knees and say, Lord Jesus, forget all the religious things I've ever done, religious prayers I've ever prayed, professions of faith I've ever made. I will be saved! I really mean it. Get a hold of God. And God will save you. He'll save you. For He tasted death for every man. Dust and ashes. Dust. The Lord said, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Job said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The Lord formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. Psalm 103 says, As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. Just that fast. I'm going to warn you, you, you folks that are in your early teens and your 20s, you're full of life. You can take the world by the tail. I could too. I could run with the best of them and shoot and jump and play with the best of them. But I'm 71 years old. And every week some new thing shows up in this old wore out body. That's the truth. That's the truth. And I have to deal with whatever's coming. I wonder now, I'll be around here, if I'm around here next week, what's going to pop up then? And I don't know who told you that the years were golden. Don't kid yourself. Amen. Are you complaining, preacher? No, I'm blessing His righteous name. God's been good to me. He's been good to me. But I'll tell you right now, I took care of this old body for the most part. I really did. I took, took, took pretty good care of it. And it now is rebelling. It's showing its age. Yes, it is. It is. It's rebelling. It's showing its age. And I marvel at some of the things, that, that the, the, the aches and the pains and the problems and everything else that begins to happen to the body. It just flat wires out, folks. And I'm just 71. I'm a spring chicken for some of the folks around here. You know, we've got people in our 90s. <laughs> God bless them. Mama will live to be 92 years old. Man, I respect somebody like that. Ninety-two she lives. Now, Hugh Sherlin is ninety-four, isn't he? 
90, 94. He and Mama are the same age? Okay, well, he's 94 now. He's, right. Hugh, Hugh Sherlin's 94 years old. The last time I saw Brother Sherlin, he said, I want, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. He said, God's given me a good life. But, but, but in other words, he said, my old body's finished. I'm ready to go. <laughs> it's, it's, it's had it. And uh, I'm not complaining. God's given me a good life. He's blessed me. He took an old dog, saved him, and put him up here pastoring a church and preaching to you. God's been good to me, folks. If, if, I, uh, if my wife turns over in the morning and finds a, finds, finds a corpse laying there, I'll tell you what, I'll meet you by the river. I will never die. I will never see death. <laughs> I will never see death. It won't happen. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. God said that. He can't lie. It's based on his character. I know him. I love him. I believe in him. I trust him. I belong to his body. I am born of the Spirit of God. And boy, when I heard that on the radio the other day, God said, you hear this, son? Listen to it. Are you hearing this? I said, yes, Lord. He said, that's where religion in Knoxville has come to. I said, Lord, I want as far away from that as I can get. I will exalt my Lord Jesus Christ until I draw my last breath in this body. Hallelujah! Until I'm gone from this world, I will lift up His blessed name at the expense of all the religions of Knoxville. It's Jesus or nothing. And if you got Jesus, you got everything. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. And I say that tonight from my heart. Bless His holy name. Amen. Amen. Father, in Thy name, in Thy blessed name, in Thy righteous name, I'll lay my head on my bed tonight, Father. I don't know if I'll wake up in the morning, but I know where I'm going. Father, my life is in Your hands. I tell You that every day. Every day. I tell you that. My life is in your hands. You are the one that's going to decide how long I stay in this world. You're the one that called me. You saved me. And I have great comfort, Lord, when I say that because I know your character. I trust you. You will do what's right. In Jesus' sweet, blessed, righteous name I pray tonight. And for Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen. Amen. Let's stand up tonight. Would you like to come down here? You've never been born again. You don't know the Lord. Folks, we love you. We're your friends. We want to help you. If you don't know the Lord, you're in the midst of people that love you. We will pray with you. And we will do everything we possibly can to point you in the right direction where you can be saved before you walk out that back door tonight. If you've never been born again.